All right. Cisco UCS Python SDKs, the best SDKs out there, in my opinion. Uh, I'm John McDonough. I'm a, data, I'm a DevNet data center automation evangelist. It's a really long title. It doesn't fit in most uh, you know, web forms. So I'm just an um, evangelist. I'm a developer evangelist, right? So my goal, my job is to bring to you, everybody who came this morning who's so excited to know about these SDKs, why they are so awesome or why you would use them, all right? So who has UCS? Oh, it's way better than my other session, right? I didn't know why they came. They didn't have UCS. Who does Python coding? It's way better. All right, you guys win. You win. I don't have anything to give you, but you win. All right. All right, well, that's great. So I'm already more excited than I was five minutes ago. The um, goal here with the Python SDK was to get you, you know, above the XML API that we had. Did anybody ever work with the XML API on, um, on the UCS? A little bit? None? Okay. What's that? You tried to avoid it? Yeah. So, all right. So Python SDK is an abstraction of that. But let's talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Um, UCS Python SDK, installation, get help, variable inspection, and metadata. Connect query filter, look at the XML. This is kind of the way I break down you know, our SDKs, whether it's for the UCS or for it's the IMCs or for UCS Central. There's a couple of things that you do. You want to connect, you want to query maybe filter those queries. You want to do some configuration, instantiate, modify, delete, stuff like that. We also have some things in there that aren't part of the original uh, XML API, this ability to compare and sync and do also to do code generation, to generate Python code from the uh, graphical interface. So we'll talk about that. And then uh, what's on the horizon? And right now, and I can actually hit that right now. What's on the horizon is just continued maintenance of the UCSM SDK, the IMC SDK for the standalone servers, and then UCS Central SDK for UCS Central. All right. So we just recently um, coined the term for this unified API. You know, everything at Cisco is unified. Unified this, unified that. Well, now we have the unified API. And why is it the unified API? Because the API is the same for central UCS manager and UCS IMCs. So if you know how to connect and query and configure in one API, you know how to do it in the other one. So it's, that's why we call it the unified API. We're going to talk mostly about UCS uh, manager today. So if you have manager systems, you know it's fabric interconnects, modules, chassis, blades, adapters. These are the main components for the UCS uh, system and what UCS Manager manages. You know that the UCS Manager manages everything in your UCS system, right? From an API standpoint, everything that you can do in the graphical interfaces, and I mean everything, right? Everything from the graphical interface can be done in the API. And the reason is that the API, or excuse me, the graphical interface is built on top of the API. There's no special hook. There's no special this or special that for the graphical interface. It's built on top of the APIs. If you hooked up a wire sniffer like Wireshark or TCP dump or something like that and looked at the messages going back and forth, you would see XML API calls. So if you can do it in the, in the GUI, you can do it in the API. It's that simple. All right. So what works with the API? You know, you could just do it directly. You can call the XML API. We have SDKs. We have a Python one, and we have a Power Tool one. I have some Power Tool and Python workshops today, uh, so you can sit down at a Mac and, and do it and in, in, uh, test it yourself. Um, the GUI and the CLI, of course, I just mentioned, were built on top of the API, and then of course, third-party, uh, you know, products have built on top of the API, and. Um, you could build your own stuff, which is probably why you're here, to figure out how to build your own stuff. The Python SDK is just an abstraction of the XML API. What does the XML API provide you? These features. 
communicates over HTTP or HTTPS. It's XML based. It's transactional. And we'll talk about transactions as part of the thing today. Standard request response cycle. While it goes over HTTP and HTTPS, it's not REST based. It's not a REST API. If you get back a 200 OK from the XML API on an HTTP request, that just means that the request response cycle was good. It doesn't mean that what you asked her to do was good or not. It's not REST. So that we're not intermingling the API with the, um, with the protocol. The role-based authentication that works in the graphical interface and the CLI is the same in the API. Makes sense, but just point it out. It's an object model hierarchy. We have a root at the top, and off the root, there's a bunch of branches. And off the branches, there's objects. And those objects have, or those objects are defined by blobs of XML, right? LS server for service profiles, compute blade for compute blades. Um, compute rack unit for the standalone servers that are now Fabric attached with UCS Manager. The objects are either physical objects or representations of physical objects, or they are representations of logical constructs. So you might have a physical entity like a memory DIM that has an object attached to it that's a fault instance. right? So you can have a physical entity that has logical entities as associated with it. There's an XML schema that you can get, so you can know exactly what is in there. Um, we have a, oh, the object browser is built into the Fabric Interconnect. Has every, anybody ever used Visore? Do you know about the object browser built into the Fabric Interconnect? All right, we should take a quick look at that. Um, full object documentation. So if you download the emulator, and I highly recommend that you get the UCS emulator, because in the emulator, is the schema and the full object documentation. It's not just the object documentation, but the um, syslog messages, FSM messages, all the things that we have in UCS Manager are documented in the, in the, um, in the documentation. But the documentation, the object model documentation, and I should call it object model plus documentation, is only in the UCS emulator. So go to communities.cisco.com and download the UCS platform emulator. The latest version, 3.12b, matches the latest release of firmware, and you're good to go. UCS APIs, just like the Fabric Interconnects, are highly available by default. Once you connect those Fabric Interconnects together and your first chassis or your first rack unit is discovered, it's highly available. Just the way it is. It's no special config to make it highly available. It just is. And then there's the event stream. So do you ever wonder about UCS Manager, how it has the ability to update the interface automatically after something? Like if you create a VLAN and, and you create a VLAN, both your interfaces will update immediately with the VLANs that were created. That's because of the event stream. The Fabric Interconnects will send out this event stream for everything that happens on the Fabric Interconnect. This XML flow comes out. And the SDK can consume it. This XML flow comes out. The graphical interfaces consume it. So anybody does anything on that UCS manager, any other client that's logged into that UCS manager will immediately get updated because of the event stream. So the event stream is something that the graphical interfaces consume and the CLIs consume, but also something that the SDK can consume. So what that means is that you can set something to you know, happen, like associate a service profile, instead of querying, not that you can't do it this way, but instead of querying if that service profile has associated, you could just listen to the event stream. And when the event stream event comes out that says service profile is associated, go on to your next thing. So those are the features of the XML API, but they're available in the SDK. This is what the object model documentation looks like, all the objects how they're contained, what they contain, their attributes, what every attribute's capability is, who can change it, um, what the appropriate values can be. If it's a text field, a regular expression that says what that text field can actually contain. So all that's contained in the object model documentation. But it's separate from the API. In the Python SDK, we've brought it together. So in the Python SDK, the metadata is included in the SDK. So you can actually do dynamic validation on the client side, whatever your program is that you write, of values that are coming into your code because of the schema is there, or the, um, the metadata is there. So if somebody puts um, you know, 9,000 as a VLAN ID, 
you can immediately, you can use the SDK to look up and see if 9,000 is a valid uh, ID. And you don't have to figure out for each field or each parameter that you want to accept what's valid. It's built into the code. So you can go ahead and query the code. So built-in metadata. I, I know I talked already about what the tree looks like. Um, everything in the tree is an object. Managed objects are of a particular class type. So um, blades and, and, and are of class type compute blade. Every object in the database or in the object model has a distinguished name. The distinguished name is built from the relative name. So each object has a relative name. For example, a chassis or uh, the host Ethernet adapter number or host Ethernet interface two is a child of the adapter one, which is a child of blade two, which is a child of chassis five, which is a child of the system. So sys is the is the root of the tree. That distinguished name, every object has a distinguished name, and that distinguished name is a unique identifier to the object within the object model. No other object will have that distinguished name. Right? So objects are of a class type. And there could be multiple objects of a class type because there could be multiple compute blades. But a compute blade like blade 2 in chassis 5 can be the only blade 2 in chassis 5 in the entire object model. So a distinguished name is a unique identifier to the object within the object model. And these are important when we get to the SDK. I'll show you. All right. So the Python SDK. Installation. So if you've... I know a majority of you are Python people, so you know how to install the stuff. You can either download it from GitHub, where it's the most current, latest version of the SDK, or you can install it with pip. Uh, we keep it pretty tight. If we release an, a version, I think the latest release is 9.0.9.3. Um, you can install that with pip. Um, but if you want the latest and greatest, you can always go to GitHub and get it, pull it down, and, and install it. So we have code repositories for UCSM SDK, and there's samples with UCSM SDK. There's about, I want to say, four or 500 samples. Anything you want to do, right? The majority of the samples were generated with the code generator, and we're going to look at that. Um, you know, because there's 0 0.9, we're calling them beta, right? I said the UCS Manager SDK is GA almost. It's almost general availability. They're pretty solid, right? There's not going to be significant change. If anything, it's going to be enhanced or added functionality in the SDKs, not a change to the methodology in the SDK. But it's beta, right? So, but I wouldn't worry. So I talked about installation. You can use pip. Or you can clone it and then set it up. We work on Python 2 and we work on Python 3. Same code base. It works for both. So if you're a 2 shop, fine. If you're a 3 shop, fine. We also have a Slack channel. I know we're a Spark company, right? Don't tell anybody, right? But our developers set, put up a Slack channel before, before the Spark was available for them. We do have a Slack channel, and we will be migrating it over to Spark, but we have a Slack channel. And you can join that Slack channel, and you can talk directly to the developers. They welcome it. Well, I don't know if they welcome it, but they want you to talk to them, right? And tell them what, if you found something that's wrong, if something isn't working appropriately, whatever. But you can join the Slack channel. You, can, you run into a code issue, you put it right in there, or you can put it into for, the forum on communities.cisco.com. We have something for Python. We have something for PowerTool. We have something for our XML API. But you can communicate with us. Me, I'm happy to help you out. Not happy. Like if it's like a Friday, I'm not happy, right? Or if it's like a Monday, I'm not happy. But Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I'm probably going to be happy to help you. Unless I'm going somewhere. I don't know. All right. So Python SDK. I've installed it. You've all installed it. Right? You're all using it. How to get help. For, for the people that, that know Python, you know, bear with me a little bit. If you're, if you're new to Python, you load the module, right? And then you, write, you just type help on the module, right? And it tells you all about the, the thing. So let's take a look.
All right. So I'm just going to load UCSM SDK, UCS handle, and import from that the UCS handle class. All right. And I have in here built into the source how to use the methods, how to build a UCS handle object, how to use a method. So it's how to how to connect, create a session, or get a handle. So a handle is just a is just a session object with the UCS manager. I can have multiple handle objects, right? So I can be connected to multiple UCS managers at once. I can have multiple handle objects. If you've changed the ports that they run on, if you're, going, if you're not using HTTPS and you're just using HTTP, you can turn security on and off. But that's the help. So help on the, on the uh, class name will give you, give you a bunch of information. All the code, you get all, when you download the SDK, you get all the Python code. There's, it's not pre-compiled. You get it, right? So if you. I want to change something, you can go ahead and do that. I mean, we'll probably overwrite it with another release. But if it's something cool, tell us in the Slack channel, Spark at some point, and, uh, and maybe we'll incorporate it. I don't know if they're going to give you credit, right? Like, you did this, but we'll just take the credit. So anyway, that's how you get help on a class. And all our classes have that. Or if you want to, right? You could just go directly to the source code itself, open it up, and there's the stuff, right? It's just in a, um, a string within, the, within the, the class, and it'll, it'll print out from the help. So something that Python knows to print out when you type help on that particular thing, right? So you get some help. Once you've created an object or created a connection, you can use the vars function of Python. That's this help and vars are Python things um, to look at the object. So let's make a connection to UCS Manager and see how that works out. Let's get rid of this. Just keep it clean here so it's I don't get confused. I just explain a little bit about the code itself. I import the module. The I instantiate an object, a handle object from UCS handle. I give the IP address, the username, the password. IP address is a string, right? So this is all strings. Uh, handle.log, and I call the method that's in the class, and I log into my UCS manager. And I'm going to then print out the, the, uh, the handle vars. Let me just make sure that one's running. All right. I guess that UCS Manager emulator wasn't running, even though I checked it this morning and it was running. Um, so vars, there's the object. That's the handle object that I have. And it's got a bunch of information in it. I can do handle.ip. I can see the IP address of the UCS Manager I'm connected to. I can say handle.ucs. And it gives me the name of the UCS that I'm connected to. There's also some functions in there, log in, log out, set XML, dump on, set XML, dump off. So you can see the XML that's going back and forth. All right. So that's how you look at the variable. You look at the inspect the variable. All right. So before I said that the um, all the objects belong to a particular class, and one of the questions I get asked the most is, how do you find out what the class name is? Right? Because the class isn't service profile; it's some class name. The class isn't um, blade; it's compute blade. Right? The class is in VLAN. It's fabric VLAN. So how do you find that out? So you can go to the um, UCS manager. And click on a VLAN object. Oops, sorry. And I don't know. Right click on the object. 
And when you right click on the object, you get this copy XML or in this context sensitive menu. And you click on copy XML. Is anybody who's familiar with the copy XML in the context menu? All right, we got one back there. We got two, three. All right, so copy XML. Some XML pops up. The very first thing, the element name in the XML is the class name. So a VLAN is a fabric VLAN. That's how you find it out. You can, you can right click on the object in the, in the graphical interface. You pop it up. The class name is the first thing. It's the element, right? So if you're not familiar with XML, the first thing is the element. Everything else is an attribute. Attributes have values. That's how we work objects in UCS Manager. There will never be, never, ever, ever be in the XML any kind of character data in, embedded in there. It will always be an element with attributes, and then it might have a child element with attributes and another child element with attributes, but there will never be, if you're familiar with XML, there will never be character data in there. This is the structure for what an object looks like. Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, we could talk after and I'll, I'll go more in depth. But that's how you find out a class name. And why do you want to find out a class name? Well, you want to find out a class name so you can understand how to get the metadata on that class, or how to query that class, or how to configure that class. You need to know what the object's class name is. If you don't, you can't configure it, you can't query it, you need to know what the class name is. If you want to know what an object looks like, remember before I said with the XML API and the object model documentation, they were separated. Well, we've embedded the metadata into the Python SDK. And if you want to know what an object looks like, you say get meta info class ID equals class name. All right, so we're going to look at, we're going to import the, from core utils, get meta info, and we're going to get the metadata for Fabric VLAN. And then there's also a couple other ways to run it. Include the properties and show the tree can be false. Include properties can be false. Show tree can be true. I'll show you what that means. We're going to run this. All right. So when I run it, I see the contained and containment structure of that object. Fabric VLANs are children of Fabric LAN Cloud. Actually, they're children of a, some other objects as well. Fabric VLANs can actually be children of four different object types. Depending on how, what kind of VLAN it is, depends on what kind of child object it, or what, what its parent object is. But a Fabric VLAN can also contain children, and those children can contain other children as well. So this is how you see the structure of an object. And, and knowing the structure of an object within UCS Manager is important because if I want to create a Fabric VLAN or a VLAN, with the Python SDK, I first have to find the parent object or the Fabric LAN cloud, which is the most typical one, create the object, and then insert it underneath the parent. That's how it works. So you need to understand the class name and its, contained and its containment hierarchy, where, where it's contained and what it contains. So this is the, the bottom command that ran. But you can see here, as I scroll back up, a lot of stuff printed out. And so let's just take a look at the first one that ran. So the first one that ran, same structure tree there. The first output stuff is about the class ID itself. The class ID is, an, um, is Fabric VLAN. How the relative name is constructed, it's constructed by net a, a static string, hyphen, and then the name of the VLAN. So if the VLAN is called VLAN 100, the name would be net hyphen VLAN 100, the first version in, with this, in which this object appeared. Who can access it? What privileges can access it? Who the parents are and who the children are. So that's all contained in that first little bit that comes out there. But then, after that, the metadata shows us the properties of a fabric VLAN, of which there are many. I'll give you, let's take a look at one that is interesting. All right, this one's interesting. So VLAN ID, remember before I said you could dynamically or programmatically validate something. Well, how do you do that? If I pull up the metadata for a VLAN ID, 
I can see that a VLAN ID has a range of 1 to 4029 and 4048 to 4093. So I could pull that up out of the metadata for a fabric VLAN object, and I could get exactly what the range looks like. So I could build my own validation capabilities. If it's a description or a name, and I think the name is a little bit further down here. Here's the name. So what does this name say? The name says, well, it doesn't have a value set or a range, but it has a pattern. And the regular expression, that is a valid VLAN name, and how long it can be, up to 16 characters. So depending on the type of the attribute is, or the value that, for the attribute, you have either ranges, patterns, or a value set. But you can do it. This is all built into the code, so you can get this metadata out. All right. Who's excited? All right, everybody's excited, all right? Even the people in front row, you can't see that the people in the back row weren't excited, but they are excited. And if it, even if they weren't, I'm going to tell you that they are, right? All right, everybody's excited. I know it. All right, so you want to connect. Well, we talked about connect already because you saw when we created the handle and we connected and we ran handle.login. We want to query. We query by class ID or class IDs. You're not limited to one class ID if you want to Query by multiple class IDs, we have a construct for that. You can query the children. You can query the children of a specific DN, a distinguished name object, and you can say, give me all the children, right, because you're very happy to see all the children, but you know sometimes you have that relative, you, only, you like one of their kids, you don't like all their kids, so maybe you only want to see the adapter class, right? Maybe you only want to see the memory class. Maybe you only want to see the fault class. So you can actually say, for this specific DN, I only want these specific children. So we have this query children um, method. We have query DN. I want to know about chassis 5, blade 2. Just that one. That's it. Or I want to know about all these DNs. And it doesn't have to be the same type of DN. It can be any DN. I want to know about this blade. I want to know about this user. I want to know about that organization. And I want to know about something else. That's cool. We'll let you do that. So query DN or query DNs. So here's just a screenshot of, of, of querying some blades. And we're going to go ahead, query the blades, loop through the blades, print out the DN. It's pretty simple, but I'll show you the the example here. And I got to change my emulator because that one died for some reason. Whoa. I have 19 chassis. Each chassis has eight blades in it. Something I didn't mention about the emulator. Um, the emulator comes with a, like four chassis by default. But I can point the emulator at a running UCS. Say, I want this UCS's hardware in my emulator. So I can take the emulator, and I took the emulator, and I pointed it at a UCS that had 19 chassis. Each chassis had eight blades. And it pulled that whole entire hardware config in, not, this, not the logical config, not the service profiles or anything like that, but the hardware config. It pulled it in, and now I have an emulator that was exactly like the live UCS that I had running in my data center, right? So if you want to program something against the emulator, but you want to match what you have running in your environment, point the emulator at it, say import this, and then you have it. So this one has 19 chassis with eight blades each. Um, and I just printed out the distinguished name. That's all. Just a distinguished name. But the blades itself have multiple attributes. And when I queried that class ID, right, whether it's one class that or one object that comes back, or in this case, several hundred objects that come back, 100 and um, what's 160 minus 8? 152, right? 152 objects came back. Whether it's one or 152 objects, they go into a list, right? So if you get one object back, it's still at list position zero. If you get 152 objects back, you loop through the list. But class ID queries always give you back a list, just so you know. All right? DN queries give you back an object. So a list, because you might get one or more. And then DNs, why would you only get back the object? Anybody? 
because it's a unique object within the system. So if you query DN, you're only going to get one thing back. Well, you might get nothing back if it doesn't exist, but at least you'll either get nothing or something. So, but you only get one of those somethings. All right. And you say, well, that's really exciting, John, but I want to see the XML that went to the Fabric Interconnect to give me that information. I said, well, I can do that, right? I can set dump XML in the handle. The handle does everything. The handle's your connection. It queries. It creates. It destroys. It modifies. It also lets you see the XML. So let's take a look at what the XML would look like. Same exact code as before. I'm going to connect, but I'm going, instead of, before I log in, and only because I want to show you what the login looks like, I'm going to set dump XML. I'm going to log in, do my query, print out the DNs, and then I'm going to log out. Um, I could, if I want to turn this, the dump off, it's unset. I don't know why I didn't have that in here, but it's unset. You know what? Let's, uh, let's go a little uh, crazy here and modify my demo code. I'm sure it won't break. And we're going to unset it. All right. Who thinks this is going to work? What's that? Oh, change the IP address, right. It wouldn't have worked. All right. I don't know why it's hanging. There we go. Not responding. We'll try it again. Right, I'm going to change it this time. <laughs> Oh, it's already, it's already changed. Well, not sure why it's not working, but this is the XML that comes out. All right, well, that's how you view the XML. It typically wouldn't shut down your, your stuff, but um, what I want to show you is that a query class ID is actually a config resolve class with a class ID. This is the way in the XML that the uh, methods are utilized. That handle actually provides a cookie. That's an authentication token. That cookie is who you are, what rights, what privileges you have, what capabilities you have. Uh, but that's the way a function call looks like in XML. We've just abstracted it up in the Python SDK. If you want to filter the output, you can create a query filter. And you can say filter expression equals, or filter expression equals model and then some string. Or whatever the attribute is that you want to match on, or that you want to use a wildcard or regular expression on, whatever that attribute is, you can put that in there. And you can actually build um, like uh, complex queries. I want this and this and this or this, not this. So we have all those modifiers and, and uh, capabilities in there. Uh, but you can build a, a simple filter. And when you do the class ID query, you just add your filter or expression. You say filter string equals filter expression. And I just have there to see what I got back, how many compute legs I got back. Um, by default, it's, a, it's a, an equals or a wild card, because Python will turn it into a wild card. Or the Python SDK will turn it into a wild card. But it, you can say equals specifically. Um, it is case sensitive. So if the model, in this case, had a lowercase m in it, that one wouldn't match. So it is case specific unless you add a flag. To say flag i to say that it's case insensitive. So this one, if it was all uppercase like before, wouldn't match anything. This one would match any, everything it matched before because the flag is uh, case insensitive. 
Now I have a Let's see. I have a filter example. So let's see. I don't, I don't know if these are B200M4s. Let me see. In this other UCS manager. It's tanking. All right. Okay. Let's change my UCS manager completely. Oh, wait. Wrong IP address. I apologize. Close the program. We'll try this one. Maybe it's um, maybe it's my Python. So I might just give that a, a restart. I just wanted to show with this that when you do the query and you do the, um, the config resolve class, it does a Sorry, Banks. I wanted to show you where the filter comes in, but I think because I use this other UCS, I didn't have that, uh, that set up the same way. Um, oh, I'm sorry. There it is. OK. So the filter. It translates into the XML config resolve class, and it just shows you that it's an XML built filter expression. So if the compute blade model is equal to that, then we would print it out. But that's the way the filters work in the Python SDK. You build a string of filters, and then when you do the query, you just attach them to the end, and you'll get back the, uh, the data that you're looking for. So let's go to the next one. We support. Equal, not equal, greater, or e greater than or equal, greater than, or greater than or equal, or greater than, less than or equal, less than. And then we also support a regular expression for a filter. So if you want to know more about how the filters work, it's in the source code. So you can run help on, on the, um, uh, the query types, or you can actually go into ucsfilter.py, and you can see how the filters are laid out and how they would work. And the demo was the stuff that I was doing along, along the way. All right. So transactions are, are creations. So I'm going to go ahead and create a VLAN. Now, when we create something, there's a couple of steps. You import the module that you're going to be working with. In this case, are the classes. The handle and then the fabric VLAN. I have to know how to create that, that VLAN, what that object looks like. So I import the class so that I can instantiate an object of that type. I log into UCS Manager. I pull out the parent object, the fabric land cloud, because I have to know where to insert the child. And then I build an object, a VLAN 100 object in this case. So I build it by saying the parent managed object or the de um, distinguished name of the parent, where that is. So in this case, it's fabric land cloud. There's only one fabric land cloud. Remember, a class ID query brings you back a list. I, only want, I know there's only one, and I only want the one. So I just specify the parent as fabric land cloud zero. And then I fill in the attributes and their values. In this case, the most important ones are VLAN name and ID. I'm not going to lie. 
It takes a little bit of experience and understanding of the API or the XML objects to know what attributes you need. So there might be some experimentation going on to figure out how that works. But you create your object. You add the managed object to the handle. Once it's in the handle, it's ready to be created, but it's not yet created. It's still just in your code. So in this case, you create the handle object, <clears throat> excuse me, you add the managed object to the handle, and then you commit it. Once you commit it, it's created. So let's see if we can create a VLAN on my non-responsive system over here. I'm going to go ahead and, and close all my Python windows. So hopefully, we're going to run this. And over here in my graphical interface, I have VLAN 1 and VLAN 100 will show up. All right, sweet. So VLAN 100 showed up. And you see, I didn't have to refresh my interface. Why didn't I have to refresh my interface? Anybody know why? The event stream, yes, that's why. So the, my graphical interface here is consuming the event stream, and it saw that VLAN 100 was created and popped it up there. Fantastic. All right. So VLAN 100 is created. That's how you do it. Create the object, find the parent that you need to insert it under, create the object, commit it. That's great. If I have one object here and there, that's fine. UCS Manager Fabric Interconnects, they have, um, you know, set aside some processing power for the, for the API calls. Um, and the rest is for the switching. And I guess somebody said, well, we're not going to give a lot of power to the API calls, because I don't know why, right? <laughs> um, you don't want to make continuous calls. Like, I'm not saying you can't do it, but you don't want to overload the, the XML API listener on the Fabric Interconnect. So it's better to do transactions. I'm going to show you a transaction, then I'll show you the, the updates and the deletes. In a transaction, I'm going to do the same exact thing. I'm going to find the parent. I'm going to create my VLANs, but I'm going to add them to the handle. Each object gets added to the handle. Now, whether I have two in there or I have 1,000 in there, when they get committed, the XML that gets sent to the Fabric Interconnect is just one big blob of it, one big chunk of XML it's way more efficient to use transactions than to use um, one, one, at a, you know, one at a time. Now, the Python SDK also supports threading. I'm not, I'm not going into it in this session, but it's definitely worthwhile looking at the documentation on site because we support threading. We support multiple handle buffers. right? So you can have multiple transactions going on all over the place. I don't know if you want that kind of complexity in your automation code for UCS. But we, you could do it. We support it in the SDK. But when I run this, it's going to be super exciting because it's going to be just as fast as the other one, but faster. And it's, that was only one, and we're doing two. I guess it didn't really make sense, just as fast, but faster. All right. It's not that one. Not that one. All right, so we're going to create 500 and 600 here. All right, so 500 and 600. But I did it in a transaction. The transaction was just adding the objects to the handle. And when you add them to the handle and then you commit the handle, they happen in a transaction. It's just a, it's a more efficient way to do the code. All right. Now, if I want to change something within UCS Manager with the Python SDK. So I want to change it. My VLAN 100 it has no um, sharing. It's none. 
right? But I want to change it to primary. So what I do is I get the object. So I use a, queer, a DN query. That's why before we looked at a class query, now we're going to query the DN because I just want this one object, right? So I query the DN for the VLAN 100. I'm going to print some stuff out, but I'm going to change the object. So now I have an object on my system called VLAN 100. I'm going to change the sharing attribute to primary. I'm going to set the managed object. So I set that managed object in the, in the handle, and then I commit it. So I can add a managed object. I can set a managed object. And let's just make sure this is what I called it. 29. So it's VLAN 100. So we're going to retrieve an object. Remember the, the object naming convention for a fabric VLAN was the static string net hyphen the name. So we're going to retrieve VLAN 100. And I'm going to change it to primary. And I'm going to set it. Right. Oh, it's kind of off the screen there. But it went from none to primary. Um, so I set an attribute. I brought the object in. And, and, and you know, just so you, it's not so much what objects we're working with here, because this convention works with all the objects, right? Fabric VLANs are fairly static, are fairly easy to work with. So, but I wanted to show you, I, I set the object. Or I got the object, printed it out, I set the object, and then I committed it, and it made the change. Now, if I want to delete the object, what do you think we're going to do to the managed object? We added it, we set it, now to delete it, what do we, what do we call it? What MO? Anybody? All right. Remove. I don't know why we didn't call it delete. I didn't, I didn't write it. But we didn't call it delete. We called it remove. So remove. Oh, I didn't change the IP address. It went away, right? OK. I think I'm at the time here, but I want to show you something real quick from a code generation standpoint. I'll show you the slides, and if you have any questions, we could talk. Um, we have two features within, within the Python SDK that are pretty cool. We have this compare and sync capability, where I can compare a source UCS to a target UCS. I can log into the source, log into the target, query a source object like VLANs, and query a target set of objects like VLANs, and I can say, what are the differences? And whatever's on my source, put it on my target. All right? Well, that's cool. But I can also say, whatever's on my source, put it on my target. And if there's something on my target that's not on my source, get rid of it. All right? So if I want to do configuration management, and I can say, I want this, I want all my UCSs to look like this. Right? I use compare and sync. Compare my source to my target. If it's not there, put it there. If it's something else is there that's not on my source, get rid of it. Or you can leave it behind if you want. All right, so that's compare and sync. Definitely worth looking at. Code generation, the old way, or the Java GUI way. So if you're still running Java GUI, if you're on version 2 or less than version 3, you would do it this way. You would start up Python SDK. You'd load some modules. You would run the convert to UCS Python. Um, uh, uh, method. And while your UCS graphical interface is running, everything you do will appear in your, in your run, your Python run. And you can cut and paste that and create your scripts from that. That's the Java GUI way. Now, the, reason we, the way we did it with the Java GUI was that we looked at the log file on your system and we captured the stuff that was coming out of that. And that's the way we were able to do it. With HTML5, it's a little bit different. You have to, in the HTML5 interface, do Control-Option-Alt-Q on a Mac or Control-Alt-Q on Windows, start recording XML, do some stuff, stop recording XML, download the, the XML file, and then run it through a convert to UCS Python, the same method, but I tell it that it's XML, and here's where my file is, and it'll create the code in your, in your run. So, it's still, the code's still in the same place, but you can take the code that was created, 
parameterize it, put it in a script, and now you, you don't actually have to worry about writing your own Python code with UCS Python SDK. And I did some demos. I didn't have time to demo that one, but we can, we can talk offline. Um, so evaluate your session, and hopefully you liked it this morning. If it wasn't that great, I still want you to say it was great. Um, <laughs> If you want to continue your education, there's, we have some demos. We have walk-in self-paced labs. We have uh, workshop sessions. And um, developer.cisco.com for DevNet. And um, communities.cisco.com to interact with us. And the Slack channel. Don't tell anybody. The Slack channel to interact with the engineers. All right? Thanks for coming. I appreciate it.